So today we're going to be looking at the first of two long poems uh, written by black writers from the Caribbean. Uh, this is going to be uh, about Edward Kamau Braithwaite's uh, The Arrivance. Now, it's actually probably um, not quite accurate to think of The Arrivance as a single long poem. Uh, rather, it's three interconnected um, long poems that offer variations on a theme, right? It's not narrative. There is no consistent storyline that runs through the whole poem. So while you will see certain voices pop up multiple times in the poem, right, it's the same person or group talking at various points, um, you will not see a continuous story develop. That's not really what's going on in the poem. So what I'll give you by the end of this is some context for understanding uh, the construction of the poem, um, the history, and sort of some cultural factors behind it, um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, image clusters that you can follow throughout the poem to get some sense of what's going on, right? Particular thematic groupings that we see throughout the three poems. So first, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Braithwaite. Um, he was born in 1930, in Bridgetown and Barbados. Bridgetown, for those of you who don't know, is the capital of Barbados. He is, as you see here, not dead. He is 87 years old and still kicking. Um, as a young man, he won a competitive scholarship to the University of Cambridge in uh, 1949. This was the same sort of scholarship uh, that V.S. Naipaul won. There were competitive scholarships that had actually been designed for the sons of rich white planters to get off to school in the mother country. Um, but by the mid 20th century, um, talented applicants of color were also winning the scholarships. So he graduated in 1953 uh, with an honors BA in history and went to work for the BBC um, on a program called Caribbean Voices. Um, so this is a radio program that was primarily concerned with the promotion of uh, new Caribbean literature. Sam Selvin was also associated with it, uh, as was V.S. Naipaul. Uh, in 1955, he worked to Ghana, I mean, he moved to Ghana, and stayed there till 1963 working for their Ministry of Education. And <clears throat> By 1966, it returned to England and was the co-founder of the Caribbean Artists Movement, uh, which more about in a moment. And he's held academic posts in the U.S., the Caribbean, and the U.K. Uh, most recently, uh, he's been um, Professor Emeritus of Comparative Literature at NYU, uh, though because he's an emeritus, right, he doesn't really have to be there all the time anymore. He lives primarily in Barbados these days. But his own um, movements over the course of his life um, mirror those we see in the three poems that make up the arrivance, right? So we have enslaved peoples in the new world in rites of passage and their descendants. We have then a return, or an attempted return, to Africa, both contemporary and historical Africa in masks, and then a sort of spreading out back into the African diaspora in islands. So a little bit about the Caribbean Artists Movement, what this was. Um, it was a group active primarily in London from 1966 to 1972. So it had a fairly short lifespan. Um, it was made up mostly of West Indian migrants uh, to the UK. They published um, a journal, a quarterly journal called Sabaku, and they also ran a publishing house called New Beacon. So it was very much, um, like rather than having any sort of stated ambition uh, or like group aesthetic, 
primarily what this was was a vehicle for getting out work by West Indian intellectuals and artists and promoting it. So it included writers and thinkers like C.L.R. James, Stuart Hall, Althea McNish, Andrew Salkey, John LaRose, and James Barry. So that sort of generation of West Indian writers that was younger than the Windrush generation, right? Those initial, uh, that initial group that came over uh, from the West Indies to England. And while the movement was short-lived, um, it inspired artists of color in Britain long after its demise. In particular, uh, the poet and reggae artist uh, Linton Kwesi Johnson um, <clears throat> owes a lot to the Caribbean artists' movement. And here we have a photograph of Sam Selvin, who was older than most of the group involved in this movement. Uh, this is John LaRose, and that's Andrew Salkey with the glasses. Now, Brathwaite's work is influenced by um, a mid, an early to mid 20th century Pan-African artistic movement called Negritude. So this was a Francophone cultural movement. Um, it was sort of sent, it, its most important writers lived in uh, places like Martinique and in Senegal, right? So the Francophone Caribbean, the Francophone African, or it was all French language. Um, and key figures included um, Aimé Césaire, uh, whose most famous poem is called uh, Notes on Return to the Native Land. Um, Leopold Sédar Senor, um, who became the first president of Senegal, and Léon de Maas. Um, they were students together um, in Paris, and adopted the name Negritude for their artistic movement um, as a way of taking back um, for black artists um, <clears throat> a term that was, gener that was uh, directed at them derogatorily, right? So they're anti-colonialist, heavily political, but as far as their imagery is concerned, it's very closely connected to surrealism, right? So the images and the flow of images in um, a Negritude poem, for example, tend to be dreamlike. Um, and the logic uh, of a Negritude piece is often really kind of more associative um, than narrative, if you get what I'm saying. And if you don't, email me and ask me. Um, politically, uh, most of the writers and artists in the movement were committed to uh, Marxist economics, right? So redistribution from the capitalist colonialist class to the working classes. Um, and they were also big believers in Marcus Garvey's Pan-African movement, right? The idea being that the African diaspora was connected by more than separated it, right? So people may have originally come from different nations, but they should, in the diaspora, recognize certain common cultural features of Africanness and coalesce around those cultural features. Now, the Negritude movement uh, was often criticized uh, by later writers actually for exactly this, re uh, this, this reason, um, that it was too essentialist, right? That it treated more or less all people of African descent as the same and having the same traditions and having the same general outlook um, and that it ignored various national con uh, distinctions, for example, you know, between, say, the Yoruba and the Igbo, or the, the Zulus and the, uh, <clears throat> the Ashanti, right? That there were, in fact, various national divisions that existed before colonialism that colonialism elided 
And so, negritude in ignoring those divisions was criticized for actually continuing certain processes of colonialism. So here we have Césaire and Senghor um, at a book signing. Right. César, uh, Césaire's uh, primary occupation was as an, was as an educator. Senghor, as I said, was a, was a politician. He was the first president of independent Senegal. Okay, so as I said, The Arrivance is really a set of three poems written over a period of three years and then published as a compilation in 1973. Now the three poems are related to each other, but they are not the same poem. Right, the first of the poems writes a passage published in 1967, uh, primarily describes the forced relocation of Africans, the enslavement of Africans, um, and their travel to the Americas via the Middle Passage, and uh, sort of the various effects, psychological and otherwise, that this continues to have on their descendants in the New World. The second poem, Masks, uh, first appeared in 1968. And in Masks, the poet returns imaginatively to Africa, and it's concerned primarily with African history and with religious ritual. Um, in particular, uh, the process of what's called syncretism. Now, you may or may not be familiar with this term. Right? A syncretic religion or a syncretic tradition is one that merges features of two or more different traditions. And most of the religions that develop in the West Indies among slave populations um, are of this sort, right? For example, uh, Haitian voodoo is a syncretism of Roman Catholicism and traditional West African religious practices, which um, often involve sort of possession by gods and spirits, right? So initially what happens in a situation like this is that the, the, right, the <clears throat> slave population has the religion of their masters forced on them. Right? They are forced to convert. And so they continue to practice their old religion under the guise of the new religion. Right? So old African gods um, are renamed and identified with, say, Catholic saints. Over time, the Catholic saint and the African god end up sort of becoming fused, um, particularly in iconography. So we'll talk about that a little bit more when we discuss sort of figures of specific gods that appear um, in these poems. And finally, Islands in 1969 um, returns to the New World, the diaspora. But the figures who speak in islands are preoccupied not so much with their current situation, but with memories or with, with memories of enslavement, but with memories of Africa and how they have retained those memories and how those memories have mutated um, and evolved in new contexts. So islands is about the relationship of the diaspora to Africa. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what it means to be an arrivant and what this has to do with the voices in the poem. So here we have, or the reason I've chosen this particular picture has to do with the French deconstructionist Jacques, Jacques Derrida's definition of the arrivant, right? The arrivant is a figure that is different from the emigrant, right, one who leaves a place, or the immigrant one who comes to a place and settles. The arrivant is the person who has just shown up, the person who has just appeared in a place. The arrivant, Derrida argues, does not have any identity yet, so its place of arrival is also de-identified. One does not yet know, or one no longer knows, which is the country, the place, the nation, the family, the language, and the home in general that welcomes the absolute arrivant. 
So the arrivant is a figure without a history, without a stable identity, without any sort of ideological complex built up around it, right? Hasn't been there long enough to be an immigrant, isn't in the place the arrivant left, so is not simply an emigrant, right? The arrivant describes the relationship with the new place when one has just landed. Now, Brathway himself has done a lot of thinking and writing about this particular figure. Um, I'm cribbing mostly from the work of Anthony Reed here. Uh, so Brathwaite says that the arrival is the figure that moves beyond the established margins, particularly in a dominance-resistant binary, right? The arrivant, the one who has just shown up, does not yet have an established relationship with the place, with any place, is not yet definable in the usual cultural terms of the new place. And so becomes the alien element of the familiar, the unknown that illuminates the known. So most of the voices that we hear in these three poems are arrivants of some sort. Right? We're looking mostly at individuals and groups that have just come to a new place or that are moving on to new places. So some of these voices include collectives, right? Some of these are group voices that we're going to be hearing. You have Africans who are taken by slave traders. You have participants in religious rituals. We also have at various points um, spades, that is, jaded, hip, younger migrants who have adopted the term, the once derogatory term spades for themselves. We heard this um, in Sam Selvin as well, in the Lonely Londoners, right? This was what most of the boys called each other. Now, spade is an ethnic slur. It's essentially sort of attack, you know, attaching on the one hand connotations of unskilled manual labor, and on the other, right, the blackness of the spade suit in a deck of cards um, to people of African descent. But many young West Indians in Britain, sort of much like the negritude artists reclaimed um, that particular term for themselves, they were, that, this is what they're doing, right? They are reclaiming as a sort of badge of identification within their group um, a once derogatory term. We also hear at some points groups of Caribbean women chatting with each other. And oftentimes those are sort of dialogues. We hear a number of individual voices in the poems as well. Right? We see, for example, in Rites of Passage, uh, this figure Tom, who has been warped and damaged by the history of slavery. Um, and yes, Tom is supposed to be equivalent to um, the Uncle Tom, uh, both of Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel and of the New World Black Imagination, right? The Uncle Tom is the person who tries to get ahead or get along uh, by acting white. We hear at other points you know, a young spade rejecting his ancestor Tom. Uh, there is also uh, in Rites of Passage um, a portion that is spoken by a Rastafarian. Important ancestors speak in masks. And yet here we have um, a picture of a group in a group of dancers in West Africa perform, uh, performing in a traditional ritual. Many of the collective voices in masks right, are participants in ritual. Drumming is particularly important in masks. All right, so let's talk a little bit as well about some of the gods and spirits that are referenced here, particularly in masks. There is um, a there is a glossary at the end of the book 
This was actually a, an idea that Brathwaite took from T.S. Eliot, who provides notes uh, for the wasteland, um, supposedly to help people understand it, but most people uh, actually find the notes to the wasteland more puzzling and confusing than they would find the poem without them. But I digress. Uh, Brathwaite gives some account of the various deities and spirits he's talking about, uh, but it might help to sort of tease out some of these images in a little bit more detail. So we'll talk about who this is in a moment. Um, first, right, Anansi, the spider, um, is a figure taken from the folklore of the Akan or Ashanti people. Right, he's a trickster hero. He is not a god. Anansi the spider is not a god. Because the spider is suspended between heaven and earth on his web, he is a sort of intermediary between the human world and the divine. Now this figure is actually sort of related to, is a, sort of um, is a god, but the concept he embodies is rather similar. Right? So this is Legba, also known as Papa Legba. Um, he is a figure in Haitian Voodoo. Um, he's the god of the gateway. And we can sort of see here right, that he is sort of identified a bit with the Roman Catholic idea of St. Peter. Right? He guards a gate. He holds a ring of keys. Um, but he's usually um, pictured as an old man with a crutch. And in particular, Legba facilitates communication between human beings and the gods, right? Legba is the god that a human being has to talk to, has to go through, in order to make contact with uh, the other Loa, the other gods. Uh, we also have some references to Ogun. Um, Ogun is a Yoruba god, the Yoruba people of Nigeria, and he's a sort of craftsman or creator god. Dambala is another particularly important uh, god in Haitian Voodoo. Um, he is the, serp the sky serpent, right? The sky father. Now, serpents have a negative connotation in Christianity because of the identification Christians tend to make of the serpent in Genesis with the devil. Although this is not a this is not an identification that the ancient Israelites would have made. Um, this is a sort of later reading onto uh, that particular text, but I digress, right? Serpents are often in other religious traditions associated with wisdom, with intelligence, with knowledge. And Dabala, the Sky Father, is that kind of god. He's a sort of god of intellect. Shango is also mentioned. Shango is another Yoruba god. Um, he is regarded as actually, he is an ancestor of the uh, Yoruba people who has been deified. Um, he's associated with iron. And in several New World African religions, he is associated both with resistance to slavery and with the resilience of slaves under the yoke of slavery. Um, so remember all of these associations when you see these figures pop up in the poem. In particular, there are poem, there are specific segments of the poem that are devoted to Anansi, to Legba, and to Ogun. So I talked a little bit about following image clusters in the poem, right? And following some of these related images, which have been identified uh, by Mervyn Morris, um, I'll post bibliographies for everything, um, for all the lectures I've done, so you can get some sense of what my sources have been for these lectures, um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, you can use these yourselves when you go, um, when you, we have to start the research paper. Um, but yeah, Mervyn Morris has identified a number of image clusters um, that express certain thematic concerns in the poem as a whole. Right, so the first he notes is journey, movement, time, river, sea. So all of these things seem to relate to motion, right? When you see these particular kinds of images popping up, we're talking about motion. We're talking about um, going forward and backward in time and space. 
Now, this is a much larger image cluster here, right? Dust, sand, dryness, pebble, stone, rock, earth, soil, water, tendril, pistol, pistol green tree, hurricane, right? Usually when these images pop up, we're talking about fertility or infertility, either of people or of the land. We have sun, moon, night, fire, sleep, excuse me, awakening, dawn, morning, day, light, dark, womb, birth, blindness, sight. This particular cluster uh, concerns sort of the, the life cycle. And we have one related to speech and conversation as well. It's speech, shout, whisper, silence. And finally, one that is directly related uh, to slavery. Gold, silver, black, red, whip, lash, iron, shackle, clink, clank, Uncle Tom. You might want to contrast this actually against the images of drums and dancing, right? Contrast the slavery image cluster against images of drums and dancing and see what you can come up with there. So here we have an image of, um, from an, a, an edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin from the 1880s of Uncle Tom to being beaten by a, cru a cruel overseer. Now, finally, music is a vitally important element of these poems. And each of the three poems references a different kind of music, right? a different styles of music that are prevalent in the African diaspora. So in Rites of Passage, most of these styles of music arose more or less directly out of slave culture or its immediate descendants. Um, work song and spiritual being first, right? Jazz, calypso, and reggae, right? Jazz being a form specific to North America, at least initially, right? And jazz represents a kind of verbal and sonic freedom, right? It's based largely on improv improvisation on particular themes. Right? Calypso and reggae grow out of Caribbean work song. In masks, mostly what we see um, is um, Akhanashanti drumming and also a great deal of jazz. And this image here is of the great contemporary jazz drummer Billy Cobham, um, who is, well, I use this image mostly because Billy Cobham is friggin' amazing. I mean, you know, as an ex-drummer, um, this guy just amazes me. Um, if you want to know why, um, listen to the first two albums by the Mahavishnu Orchestra, in particular, The Intermounting Flame, and you'll hear just how good this guy is. Seriously. And finally, in Islands, we have a greater variety of primarily Caribbean forms of music. Uh, jazz is still present, but there's also a lot of reference to steel drumming, to limbo dancing, Bena, or sort of West Indian folk song, um, and Haitian drumming, right? So a lot of this is percussive, right? Is mixing those percussive drumming traditions discussed in masks with the folk song derived traditions discussed in rites of passage. And the jazz, of course, is all over the place, right? Jazz is all over the poem. All right, so I hope that this gives you a better sense of what is going on in a poem that can seem a little bit impenetrable um, if you're reading it with no experience and no background. Um, so read the poem, look for the image clusters, think about music, think about the idea of the arrivance that the poems um, promote and
and we will talk about this on the discussion boards.